I used to think I should know all the answers mm. when I was a new manager. That's what I've been promoted for. That's why I'd have a pay rise. Meet Louise Howells, entrepreneur and leadership coach. She's here to help new managers avoid making rookie mistakes. I was managing a team older than me, usually predominantly male environment because I was a woman in tech. I focused on new managers because it's such a vulnerable point for people. If their introduction to a management role isn't going so well. That can be a make or break for somebody. I want to help people become confident and successful managers rather than feeling like they're just out there on their own. We have to remember that people are not job descriptions. These people chose a job. What they didn't pick was the team that came with it. There's stuff that's not going well in the team and people have got a tendency to hide that because they don't want their manager to know about it. I don't want those people who are new managers to become an accidental bad boss because they've not had the right support. Those new rookie managers have just been promoted. What's the biggest mistakes they make? So, Louise, <laughs> we're here. <laughs> Welcome to Anatomy of a Leader. Thank you. So good to meet you. I love finding people on social media and then meeting them in person. I just find that whole process fascinating. Like you're in Manchester, I'm in London, you know, our past maybe would have crossed, but like being so visible on social media and being able to connect on the same topic. I just yeah. find that incredible. So, so thank you. Thank well, you for coming on. Thank you for reaching out. Thank you for inviting me and uh, having me on as well. So for those people who don't know you, can you give a very, very quick summary of your background, how you started and what you're doing now? So like one minute. Yeah. <laughs> 60 seconds. Go. 60 seconds. Yeah. Elevator pitch. Yes. So I've been working in tech for 21 years, as I was uh, saying to you earlier on. And so, yeah, always tech, always web or product and range of different areas. So whether that be not-for-profit or marketing agencies, a bit of a mix, really. But 10 years of those were spent in leadership positions, um, especially senior leadership positions, working with business owners, CEOs to help grow and scale their companies. And what I was always brought in was to look at how we were performing as a team and then look for improvements for that. So we've worked with a lot of different teams on a lot of different issues, a lot of different processes to basically build those high performing teams that people actually wanted to be part of and wanted to come to work at. And tell me a little bit more about what you're involved with now. After 10 years in senior leadership experience, I thought, you know what, there's a real gap here for those new managers who are being promoted and they're completely lost at sea. They don't know what to do. They don't know how to manage a team. It's the first time they've done it. So I've been sharing leadership and management advice on Instagram and other socials to help people with that so they don't feel like they're all alone and also developed a new manager course as well where people can go online, learn bite-sized chunks on how to avoid those common mistakes I just see time and time again in all the different companies I've been to. And why focus on new managers? Why that sort of point in time in particular? The reason why I focused on new managers was because it's such a vulnerable point for people. So that can be a make or break for somebody if their introduction to a management role isn't going so well and they're burnt out, they might decide it's not for them. It might be just because they haven't had the right start into management. So I want to help people become confident and successful managers rather than feeling like they're just out there on their own because so many managers have the same problems. Just a lot of people don't want to talk about it. Mm. Tell me about when you first became a manager. What was that like for you? And just to put it into context a bit. Scary. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I did a post about this recently, actually, which was when I first became a manager, I had no idea what I was doing. And it's right. I didn't have any idea what I was doing. I'd seen other managers do what they do. So I took bits from what? would work well for me, being managed by them, what didn't work well for me, what I'd seen others have that just put it all together and tried to find my way. So yeah, it was very scary at, at first. I was always managing a team older than me usually, usually predominantly male environment because I was a woman in tech and still not as many of us um, in tech as well. So yeah, it was a, a scary time, I think, is the, probably the best way to describe it. But it's interesting that, you know, a company that will promote somebody but not give them any kind of tools to, to manage, it's almost like just because you're good at your job, yeah, that doesn't necessarily translate into you becoming a great manager of people because actually what you're doing becomes very different. It's not just about doing your job. It's now also adding a whole other skill set yeah. in terms of managing people. So you're effectively doing two jobs. Yeah, it's a, it's a brand new role. And I don't think people 
realize that. I don't think some people understand that maybe the business owner who's given that person that promotion maybe or the person taking that promotion. It, it is like going back to school on day one where actually you, you don't know what you're doing and that shouldn't be taken lightly. And that's why I say it can be quite lonely because that mm. expectation that is then put on you by the people you're managing, your own boss, and then yourself can be very, very overwhelming very quickly, which is why we see a lot of people getting burnt out at work because they think they should have all of those answers. So yeah, there's certainly something I see there. And it's not just the tech world either. It's I've spoken to friends who are in different industries and they've said that they've seen the same. You'll have people who are extremely good at what they do. So say, for example, a technical developer, very good at what they do. And they've been with the company so many years and they might want to look to progress their career. So they want a pay rise. And what I've seen happen is they will get given a pay rise because the company want them to stay. They want the pay rise. So that sounds good. But what happens is they're like, well, if we're giving you this pay rise, we're going to have to give you a new job title and some management responsibilities as well. So actually, we're going to need you to start leading a team of, say, four developers or six developers or even 10 or more. Um, and that might not actually have been the path that they want it to go down. Mm -hmm. And I'm a big advocate for having like these two paths. So you've got your specialism, your skill set, and then you've got your managerial path. And I don't think that having a pay rise and being able to progress in your career should always translate into a management path. Mm. And I think that's very tricky for business owners to separate sometimes. Um, so yeah, there's got to be a better way of doing that. If you run a company and you see somebody who's very, very skilled at what they do, you're kind of template thinking is well it needs to be a leadership position as opposed to how can we compensate that person more for the skill that they're really good at yeah. and create a different pathway to progression for them because you don't want to lose those people I mean they're super valuable but they don't necessarily need to want to or good at managing people yeah as well exactly so for bosses for managers looking at their teams to decide who they should promote can you give any tips in terms of what to look out for yes so I think the people who are able to take a step back look at the bigger picture who will involve different team members at different points the people who can forward think they can spot issues on the horizon they'll they'll show natural leadership tendencies leadership skills that are poss possibly a path for them However, it might be that you've got two different versions. So I've seen some companies it work quite well where you've got like an operational manager and then your line manager. So you have both, which one would look at more of the day-to-day -day work, which is where maybe the very experienced technical skill set comes in and they work with them day-to-day -day on projects and workload and what they do and the quality of work. But then all of the actual more person management bit comes from somebody else. Because that is it, because it is a different skill set. It is a different job. So mm -hmm. I think it's understanding what's going to work best for the company structure, best for the team structure. It all depends on the size of the company as well. But ultimately, if you're taking a very skilled person away from a five day a week job that they're doing really well over here, and then putting management responsibilities on them that they're not enjoying and they're maybe not very good at because it's not what they wanted, <laughs> it's it's going to affect everything. It'll affect them, it'll affect the team, and it'll affect client work because they're being taken off their projects to manage the team. So it has a massive ripple effect as well that I think the instant reaction from a lot of people I see is they want to leave. So we need to make them stay and we'll give them a pay rise and we'll promote them to manager because we need to keep them without thinking what that will look like in six months or a year's time. Hmm. I think it's also normalizing a path that is not just a leadership management path for mm -hmm. somebody, because I think there is this sort of not glamorization, but like the only way for you to progress is to step into a leadership role as opposed to being extremely good at what you do. Yeah. And so I think creating more of a path for those individuals that it does not require them to be almost burdened with having to lead people. I think in my perspective that I think that's where a lot of progress can be made that not everybody needs to lead yeah not everybody needs to manage uh in order to progress in their career no definitely and going back to you know those new rookie managers they've just been promoted they're about to start 
managing a new team? Like what's the biggest mistakes they make? So I think one thing I see quite often is this, they, they come in to shake things up. So there's a lot of authority building, they go in all guns blazing, just like stamp their authority, if you like, because that's what they think they need to do to get people to listen to them, for them to then you know, put their ideas out and, and get them to do things that they want them to do, because that's maybe what they think a manager should look like. And rather than them actually trying to get people to listen to them, it should be the other way around. They should be taking that time to listen to their team because that is where all the answers are going to lie over the next six, 12 months, two years, whatever it be. That's where all that knowledge is. So that, that's probably the biggest mistake I see people doing. There's no trust built there. What they're doing is just alienating themselves from their team. They're building a barrier from day one. And it's very, very hard then to start taking those bricks down. Because it's like it's ego working. driven and it's about yeah. I should know it all. Yeah. And hence, that's why people will listen to me as in like you hold all of the cards in terms of like, I need to be able to know everything that's going on. So that way I will get the sort of, you know, the natural authority to to kind of tell people what to do. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's exactly it. And I used to think I should know all the answers mm -hmm. when I was a new manager. Like that's what I'd been given the job for. That's what I've been promoted for. That's why I'd had a pay rise. I needed to know all the answers because... That was what a manager did, right? And if I didn't know the answer to something, I'd feel like I'd have to maybe just like try and improvise a little bit to show I still knew what I was doing or I'd panic. You know, I'd think, oh my word, someone's going to realise that actually I've got no idea what I'm doing. <laughs> I'm going to get fired. I'm going to lose the house. I'm not going to be able to pay the bills. And then you spiral really easily. Mm -hmm. And actually it took time to realise that no one is actually expecting me to have all of the answers. Mm -hmm. And... I shouldn't have all of the answers. That's why I'm still part of a team. And I think that's another thing I see managers do is they, especially if they have promoted from within, so if they were already in the company rather than coming from outside, they feel that they have to elevate themselves above the team, mm -hmm. which, yes, hierarchically on a old-fashioned structure, we might have that on in drawing, but actually you're still very much part of that team. So it, it's about understanding the new role within it rather than over it. It's that expert thinking. It's if you were an expert in a domain and then you are given leadership responsibility, it's almost like you, that, that expert thinking means that you have to be an expert in everything that the, all the other people yeah. are doing. Whereas actually, and I don't know if you find this, especially within the tech space or, you know, as we get into more technology AI, there's a lot of experts that are on the team and not one leader can be an expert in one or all of those areas. Mm -hmm. So actually their job is to tap into the knowledge of those individuals, make them work as a team make them work as a team, like create the environment yeah. and the right support structures that they collaborate and perform as a team and to provide that leadership to them as opposed to being an expert in all of them. So I feel like in the workspace, how the structures are created is changing because of the fact that there are many, many experts being led by a person who may not be an expert in any of those areas. Yeah, for sure. So like, as my career evolved, I led teams of developers usually or project managers. I I didn't code anymore. I didn't know the best way to develop something. Like that was what the team were there for. That's, you know, that was their expertise. That was their knowledge. That was their skill. So it was knowing when to tap into people's opinions, to people's ideas at different times to actually really get the best out of them. And what I mean, I'm a massive fan of something called team norms, um, which is, if you've not heard of it, is where you sort of write your own guidebook for the team. And you do this together as a team. And that allows everybody to actually get that collaboration, that way of working together. Um, something I could, I could talk about the whole podcast probably about that. Because yeah. <laughs> it's something I'm really a big fan of and I've just seen work so well in actually building what you say, that collaborative area for them to work and you as the leader and manager facilitating that with the team so break it down how does it work like how do you sit down and do that as a team so with team norms you would not it's not something the manager makes on their own 
So you have to do it with the team. It has to come from the team because it needs to buy in from the team. It works really well in places that are going through maybe a lot of change or if there's a little bit of toxicity in the workplace as well, where things are just starting to, you know, niggle at the edges. But in essence, what you do is you work with your team to actually write a guidebook, rule book, playbook, whatever you want to call it, on how you'll work together. Mm -hmm. So what I try and explain to the managers is we have to remember that people are not job descriptions. Like we might have eight developers or eight project managers all have the same job title and they've all applied for the same job description when we've advertised it, but they're very, very different. And these people didn't choose to spend eight hours a day together. They chose a job that either paid well or it's got great clients or it's close to them, whatever it be, whatever their reason for picking it. What they didn't pick was the team that came with it. That that just came along and you walk in on day one and that's what you're given, right? So that's the unknown when you join a company. And expecting those teams to just work together and be high performing doesn't doesn't work. And so we have to actually write that playbook of how we will work together. So in there, you can include anything you want, whatever you need to for your teams. Every company's different, every team's different. So things that I would always recommend are in there of how are you going to communicate with each other? So some places I've worked love Slack or love email or they're all about video calls. Well, it's like, well, which one's going to work for us as a team? Because you've all come from different places from, with different ways of working. What will work for us now together? How will you work with clients? How will you work on projects? What about if you disagree with something on a project? How are you going to raise that? Because what I often find is when there's tension and conflict, the manager becomes the middle person because they think they should do because they're there to build the harmonious team. And you get team member A complaining about team member B. And rather than talking to team member B about that issue and solving it between them, they come straight to the manager. Because it's like the judge. Exactly. They don't want to be the person who delivers the bad news. They don't want to risk not being liked. Mm -hmm. um, but it's okay for you to do that as the manager. So the manager gets the, the brunt of it, if you like. They get put in the middle of it. But with team norms, you actually talk about that stuff. You talk about, okay, well, what happens if on this project you disagree with something or somebody says something that you don't like how, how are you going to deal with it what's the way that is acceptable that we agree as a team to do this is it actually it's a really safe space a you just call it out online in the meeting or if you're in a physical meeting room you just call it out and we're all okay with that because we've agreed we're okay with that but if not then how do we deal with that is it a private message afterwards and then we jump on a video call and some of that sounds really, really simple. But unless you actually agree as a team, no one really knows where they are with it. There's no, there's no, there's no anchor yeah. for them to be like, oh, by the way, this is how we would deal with this. And then when you get new people come in and you're onboarding, you go, okay, if you have this, this is how we deal with this. So you've got, it's like playing a game with no rule book otherwise. Yeah. Everybody just sort of makes up the rules and has a go at what they think is right. It's a, it's a framework for dealing yeah. with issues and saying, well, this is, as a group, we've decided that this is the best way for us to kind of like manage conflict and have these conversations. Yeah. Um, there was somebody on the show, um, Grace, who is an Olympic medalist in rowing. And what's really interesting is because they it's a team sport and they also having to deal with each other's differences, each other's, you know, dark sides or, you know, different individuals respond to different things in a different way. Yeah. And so they having amongst themselves also to, to say, well, in this scenario, when we were rowing and you did x you know this is what has happened to us but in the next instance you know when the same thing is going to happen this is how we're going to react to it so yeah. there's a lot of parallels between rowing above i mean the proverbial yeah. of being in the same boat together right <laughs> yeah um absolutely for those people who are listening who are interested in in this where can they go and find out about using this framework to create norman team norms team norm yeah so it, there is, I've got a load of advice actually on my, my Instagram page about Team Norms and Fair Lights to talk about a little bit. And I've got a feature length presentation on it too, which I can send to people if they're interested. Mm -hmm. But it is about finding what is right for your team 
so what works for one doesn't always work for another and yeah you can have very small things you can have very big things on that mm -hmm. but I would definitely say communication conflict and behavioral values are something that should they're like the three golden ones I should would say should be on anybody's team norms for sure mm. um I have some questions from the audience okay um <laughs> nothing too challenging but I thought maybe we'll we'll take some some of the questions um let's have a look yeah this is a good one so do you believe traditional management hierarchies are obsolete in today's agile and remote working world and should we rethink leadership models entirely okay there's definitely something that needs to change, I would say. So it probably relates to um, one of the earlier points that we were talking about around the, the different management styles, uh, sorry, different management paths that you can have and how that works. I don't see that in many companies where you have people like operational and then line manager. I don't see that that often. So that might be something that could happen more. But I think we really do have to listen to what people are saying about how they want to be managed how they want to work because what worked however many years ago okay. it doesn't work anymore like we've got five generations of people in workplaces now who all have different values all have different ways of working and what I've personally found is you've got maybe the older generation who have had a job for a long time you know it's that mentality of you go into a job, you stick at a job, you know, you're lucky to have a job, you pay the mortgage, you retire sort of thing. And that's absolutely fine. But then you've got a different generation who have something very different in their head. And that's not to say one is right and one is wrong because it's not, as we were saying before, wasn't it? There's no right or wrong. It's yeah. whatever works for you and whatever your path is. But I think sometimes people can think, oh, hang on a minute, that's how I did it. So that's how you should do it now. And rather than actually seeing each other's differences and viewpoints as a positive it can sometimes cause that conflict as well um but yeah sorry just to circle back I suppose with the a different generation coming in now is they want more of a personal connection at work they want personal values to be reflected in their workplace they want more open communication so that style of very top down and this has come from the top and we're just doing it which you know is stuff that I got told to me um mm. that is I don't think that's going to work mm. in the future or probably isn't even working. I think it's the idea honest. of like the authoritarian, you know, top down, yeah. you shall do this, as I say, and there is no alternative way of doing that. Like people are, I think in the world where you're dealing with information and experts, you know, you're not just dealing with mechanical parts anymore. Mm. So the person really wants to feel respected that their knowledge is valuable because it is they can walk out at any point yeah and then just you losing a very valuable expert resource so for sure it's like that top-down hierarchy is uh is being turned on its head where employees especially if they're exceptionally good especially in tech mm -hmm. when you have someone who is just exceptionally good yeah um they can yeah they hold a lot of value hold a lot of power yeah, and I think that's where people need to tap into that more. And mm -hmm. ultimately, they will just leave. So we are sacrificing people who are really good at their job because people are trying to hold on to a more traditional, if you like, hierarchy. And really, it should be, this is what, if, if someone at the top is like, this is what I want to do, it's my business. Okay, well, let's, let's, let's research this. Let's understand. Let's have a little bit more data behind it, maybe. Let's actually get a focus group together to find out what other people are thinking about that. Maybe they've seen it and done it before at a different company and it was an absolute nightmare. Or maybe it was a great idea and they already know how to implement it. Like, but what I find is the, the older traditional model is that it's like, right, we're doing this now. We're going in this direction. And there's no narrative around it there's no connection like I say you know people want a more personal connection now to where they're working you know they're spending a lot of time there they want more balance so if they if, if people want their team to get on board with the direction of travel whatever that is they need to understand why and they also need to understand that it's it is the best thing to do or if it's not they need to be able to challenge that <laughs> and that's I think is very important that we understand that as we go forward to so any new managers coming, we need to understand that we need to tap into that. Mm -hmm. 
In your experience, do most companies promote the wrong people into management positions? And what are the common pitfalls? Okay, so I can't say most because I don't know, but I do see a lot of people make those reactions that we spoke about earlier around wanting to keep people, so promoting them into a management role when it necessarily isn't maybe the best thing for them or for the company. So that is something I do see, especially when they're not given any support around that. So if you're going to put somebody in a management position, they definitely need some support network around them, whether that be training, a mentor, coach, not just going, okay, on Monday you've been promoted and you've now got the team that you were in, you now have to manage mm-hmm. and you just need to get on with that. So yes, I do, I do see companies do it. Any solutions to it? Any ideas in terms of if... If you're thinking, well, I just really want to keep this person, but maybe the leadership position isn't the right one for, or management position isn't mm-hmm. quite right for them. Like, what, what can they do? So they can look at different career pathways. So looking at that skill set. So maybe they become a specialist in that area, for example. It gives them more of what they want to do and what they love. So if they're ultimately looking to retain the member of staff they need to understand their why they need to understand why they come to work what's important to them and what they want to do rather than going here's a promotion and expecting them to be really grateful for something they didn't really want Mm -hmm. um but because they've asked for the pay rise they've they sort of have to say yes to get it so it's this weird area Mm -hmm. so actually looking at how how and when different career pathways can split between specialization and maybe a leadership role for example because if they if they don't get that right and they are promoting people into it who aren't necessarily the right person for the role or they just don't want to do it 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 just has such a ripple effect it will lead to issues with client projects for example it will lead to issues in the team so you've got a team now being managed by someone who doesn't want to manage them because they don't like it or they can't do it Mm -hmm team starts to get frustrated so everybody in that team then starts looking at LinkedIn and recruitment sites because they want to leave so all of a sudden by retaining one person because that was the panic that was the instant reaction to keep them it's actually caused a ripple effect of other people now wanting to leave and also maybe resenting that person who did get that leadership position because there might be somebody in that team who did want it Mm. yes and then they're looking and seeing all the things that they're doing wrong yeah and knowing that they can do a better job with it yeah yeah. just like feeling the unfairness of it all yeah and then what do you do do you demote that person like that's that would be such a knock on their confidence probably what sort of message is that sending to everybody else like what does that even look like when they update their LinkedIn to be like I was a manager and now I'm not Mm -hmm. even though that might have been absolutely the best thing and they're really happy with that you've got to have a look at what that does to like your personal brand too then Mm -hmm. so yeah Yeah. tricky very much so What do great leaders do right? Listen. (laughs) They listen. They listen and they build trust. I think they're the the two things that great leaders do because Mm. any any management job, if you come into it, whether you've been promoted from within or you've come from outside, if you're looking to help improve that team, if you're looking to build a high-performing team, sometimes means change. More often than not, it means change. You will not change anything unless the team has trust in you they need to know that you have got their back you are there for their best interests because no no i say no one a lot of people don't like to change or they change at different rates so you have people who are like the early adopters the late adopters they they don't want to do it unless there's trust there and and why should they why should they just blindly follow you on some mission that you you're telling them is going to work So there's the trust side of it, but then also there's the listening side of it. So if you want to bring that change in, you need to listen to the team to understand what needs to change, why that needs to change, and how you can change it with them. Because if you can crowdsource those ideas and that information from them, like we were saying before, they're the experts. They're going to have all the answers in the room already. You just need to facilitate that conversation. If you can get the change from them, it is going to have far better buy-in as well. And they're actually a part of that then. So again, with that personal connection that people are wanting at work more, that's how you do that. You get that. So yeah, listen and trust, definitely. Mm. It's Listening is, I know people say like listening, but it's it really is so critical mm-hmm. of being able to sit down, put your ego aside 
and actually hear what the other person is saying rather than just doing, you know, paying lip service or whatever the term is. Like really pay attention what that person, you know, where they're coming from and take that on board in order for you to then make your decision to move forward. Because as I say, like assumption is the mother of all fuck ups. (laughs) (laughs) And I think without listening, you just make assumptions. Yeah. And and, like... You can get so blindsided as a manager. You can get so blinkered with this this change that you want to do. You, you know, you're not listening, or you're, you're you're pretending to listen. You're lip service, as you say. Your people are telling you it's wrong, or the team are telling you something. And 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 sometimes, you know, you've re- you have got to challenge the team, or sometimes maybe you have got to just push through those difficult bits a little bit because actually, you know, you just need to turn that corner, and and you will get the benefits of it. But knowing when to listen to somebody when they're telling you this isn't working or this isn't a bad idea or here's the data to prove that it's not working, Mm -hmm. you have to really put that ego aside and go, okay, I need to stop. And that is also another good thing that a great leader will do is they know when to stop, they know when to change course, even if they told everybody it was going to be the best idea in the world. Mm -hmm. You have to know when to stop as well. And I think it's super important with any team that you hold retrospectives with them. So anything that I always used to do with teams was if we're implementing something new, we all talk about it as a team, loads of different ways of doing this, but we would all talk about it. We'd all actually have an opinion on it. We'd all come to an agreement. We'd all get that buy-in of how we were going to do something. And everybody would understand the why for it as well. This might have come out of the team. It might have come from a different department because of maybe a target we're trying to hit, whatever it be. We would always say, okay, right, here's the solution we've, we're all going to go with here now. So we've all got the buy-in and we'll review it. So we used to run in tech world, we have sprints. So it's like two weeks of work. So you have two weeks, review, two weeks, review. At the end of the first two weeks, I would always say, right, give me any feedback you've got. Everybody, it's all very open as well. We all see each other's feedback, what's working, what's not working, what needs tweaking. Second sprint would be the tweaks. So, okay, right, that didn't quite work or this thing over here isn't working here with this process or the way we're doing this. Do the tweaks. And then third week would be like the actual real evaluation because we, one one sprint to settle into it, a second sprint to tweak it, a third week to really see if it works. And at the end of that three, three sprints, which would be six weeks, you actually got to see if it was going to work or not, um, or whether it needed a little bit longer on the trial or whether it needed a little bit more adjustment. So I think that's the key is not, just going going in and just going well this is what we're going to do because we've said we're going to do it if it's not the right thing you do need to know when to stop to Mm. I think within the tech space there is this more experimental let's try to test something out as opposed to we already know what it's going to be so there is already that undercurrent of it's an experimentation so let's make the most of how we can test fast to see if something's working and when you build a product in this way you can also start to apply that to management styles and hence the I keep forgetting what it's like then the norms team norms <laughs> team norms is also this kind of almost experimental yeah. way of saying you know let's let's build a sort of a structure around it but we can come back and review it yes if it's not working and I think a lot of traditional companies can benefit greatly from using this type of framework within their management teams because it's still very much that top-down approach which um or managing experts or you know people who are very very technical does or have an opinion about how they like to be managed yeah. themselves yeah then that doesn't work yeah no for sure Let's take another question. So um, let's have a look. What is your take on managing up? Is it a skill all managers should master or does it perpetuate toxic workplace cultures? That's a mouthful. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) you try saying that (laughs) five times. Okay, so I've seen a lot of this on TikTok recently about upward management contributing towards toxic workplaces. And I think it's all about what we mean as upward management and how that's being done. So with upward management, I'm seeing people say that it's people are upward managing because their boss is terrible or they're having to change their behavior for their boss or it's almost like a form of manipulation to get them to buy into their ideas. 
and that doesn't sound like a great idea <laughs> so no that that I think is is a, is a bad route to use and, a, and not a reason to use upward management I think upward management can be used in a way that benefits not just you your manager but also your team so for me the team has got to be at the forefront of everything you do as a manager and a leader you are like their biggest cheerleader so upward management can be things like your communication preferences with your line manager it can be things like how you'll work so for example you might be somebody who likes to be left alone to problems and you'll stay if you need help or you might be somebody who would actually prefer to brainstorm with their manager first and then go away and take it so explaining that and agreeing that with your manager on how you want to work together is a good way of upward management things like status reports of these are how things are going so for me I would include these are things that are going well just so you're aware also you know making sure that you credit that team you need to advocate for your team here you know make sure that your boss is seeing everything that's happening within the team but then you need to uncover this monster over here <laughs> you need to tell them the things that aren't going so well as well because otherwise you just and I think this is where this toxicity bit can come in is people are trying to give this perception of everything's great and it's all great because of me and that's not the case. It's great because of the team and you're contributing towards that because you're part of the team still. But also there's stuff that's not going well in the team and people have got maybe a tendency to hide that because they don't want their manager to know about it. So what happens then is the team below that manager are going, well, there's all these problems here. Why Why isn't the manager above stepping in or saying something? Like they... They just think everything's fine. And then you start to get this distrust, distrust, and then that's where the toxicity starts to breed because there's a lack of trust. So horizon scanning is really good with the team to then be able to present it back to your own manager to be, here are the issues that are coming up. These are the things that the team have raised. These are the things we're going to be doing about it. And also they're good then to support you too. So a manager needs support too. So actually saying to them, this is how I like to be supported. This is how I want you to feed back to me when maybe I'm doing something that I could be improving on, for example. Like they have to have that relationship. It's almost like the team norms, but between the two managers, mm -hmm. because ultimately everybody is still part of that team, that bigger organization, whether it be the manager's manager's manager. They're actually still all part of just a bigger team and it's just understanding how people can work well together mm. so so yeah I see the I see the both sides of it for sure um but used wisely I think can be beneficial mm. it's that idea of first of all understand yourself like yeah what you know how you work best how you like to be managed mm -hmm. and then being able to have that conversation in a constructive way but also being truthful when things are not really working out. So to be yeah. able to have, yeah, to, to build trust, you need to be able to be completely upfront and honest. Yeah, you've got to be transparent with what's going on in your team. And mm -hmm. like for me, it, like when I was reporting to some of the CEOs I used to work for, there's, you couldn't get hold of them sometimes, right? So somebody in my team may never speak to the CEO. And I'd be like, okay, I'm meeting with... CEO tomorrow or next week, whenever it is, you should give people more notice than that. But I'm, me I'm meeting with the CEO mm -hmm. about these things. Is there anything anybody from the team wants me to raise that I've not put on here? Like being transparent the other way as well. But these are things I'm going to talk to them about. Is there anything missing? Because sometimes they might be like, oh, what about this thing? Oh, yeah, of course. Great idea. I'll take it to them. I'll have that conversation with the CEO and I'll tell them, you know, I'm going to report back to the team on how this has gone, any key points. And then at least I would be a feedback loop for them. Like I would always encourage if there was time for them to meet more of the team, do that by, by all means or hold skip level review meetings or I've invited old bosses to team retrospectives to come and sit in to build that relationship. So I think this gatekeeping relationship can be quite toxic of you can't speak to the manager's manager because mm -hmm. that would be disrespectful. Um, I think actually that needs to be broken down. Again, going back to that question of, the traditional older hierarchies is that still going to work it's like I remember way back when if you spoke to the person's manager's manager that was a big thing no, no, no. Was a big, in fact I did it once and, uh, <laughs> and what it, happened it didn't go down too well I'll put it like that <laughs> what happened um 
well, they just uh, basically didn't get the meeting in the end. Um, they were like, well, why didn't you come to me first? And I, there was an open call to go speak to the CEO. So I was like, great, I'm, I've got some ideas. I'll go speak to them. <laughs> and my boss found out at the time and they were like, well, why didn't you come to me? And I was like, well, because there's a call to say I can go straight to the wasn't trying to go around you. Um, that's more of a reflection on how you've taken that than anything else. So it, the meet, I don't think the meeting did happen. It's a long time ago now, but yeah, there's that older way of... Um, how did you feel about it. that when you didn't get the meeting? Um, a mix. I felt like I'd done something wrong. So I was a lot earlier in my career. I felt like I'd done something wrong and I didn't do it again. <laughs> and I felt a little bit like, I'd had something stolen off me almost. Mm -hmm. Yeah, to be like, well, that was an opportunity that I've now had taken away from me. So, yeah. And how did you see that boss sent after that? Fine, I think I probably just moved on. I think if we go back to like those generations of working, my parents were, you know, very much of that generation and mindset of get a good job, you stay in that job, you get a great pension, Keep your head down. And you crack Don't on. rock the boat. Exactly. Don't rock the boat. Be grateful you've got a job. Mm. And like where I grew up, there wasn't that much career opportunities either. Um, so I, I completely understand why they gave me that advice. Mm -hmm. So I probably just moved on and, and carried on, to be completely honest, because it was a lot, a lot earlier in my career before I moved to Manchester and things as well. How would you handle it now, knowing what you know? Knowing what I know now, how would I handle it? I'd have the meeting. <laughs> <laughs> Screw you. <laughs> I'm going in. I'd have the meeting and I might actually invite the person with me because there's clearly some underlying maybe insecurity about what I'm going to say or something like that. Like I try and understand their why. I think that's one of my things that I always do in any situation is understand the why, whether that be a team, a manager, a client, whatever it be, a friend understanding that why so is it because they're worried I'm going to say something and it's going to reflect badly on them so maybe I could talk to them about what I wanted to express to put their mind at ease and then also say right I'm gonna still have that meeting yeah um but if there was still a lot of unease there I would say well why don't we go together mm. and we can do it you, you know you can sit in there's nothing to hide yeah there's nothing to hide yeah. so yeah I would definitely have that but like I say I think probably probably my uh parents uh, voice was in my head with with that advice of I think so much of it know. is is the voices that we hear as we're growing up or in our well, yeah. in our social circle that we absorb and just they're just sitting in us subconsciously and I think part of becoming great manager becoming a great leader is unpacking all of those stories that we tell ourselves about what should and shouldn't be done and I think a lot of it is the self-reflection piece that you do with yourself and I think in in work it's like whenever you have that feeling of tension or you're triggered or something that kind of rubs you off the wrong way it's like that's the moment to pay attention to and yeah. to listen and to try to explore so not spiraling into uh, you know, this kind of like anxiety filled like thoughts and reflection, but actually try to listen to what's the underlying thing here, because that's the, that's like the alarm bell saying something's off here, like investigate. Yeah. It's like why. a data, but it's the why. And it's yeah. like the, the data point for you to know that something's not quite right. Yeah. Um, who's the best boss you've worked with? No. <laughs> oh, that's so hard. Um, Sometimes there isn't one. I mean, I have been fortunate to work with some yeah. great bosses, to be fair. And all have been good mentors to me in terms of helping me understand more about my leadership style. Um, yeah, there's one boss that really stands out for me. And he, he gave me a lot of room to grow. He gave me a lot of trust, a lot of autonomy. And he always had my back. So like, if I wanted to try something, he would be very supportive. He was a very good, very, very good cheerleader, very, very good advocate for me, very honest, would tell me how it was, would give me advice, even when I didn't want it, <laughs> but I maybe needed it. Um, yeah, he was very good. He was very supportive and he would never take credit for something that I'd done. He, so he was that biggest cheerleader. I think a lot of that that I, I, I learned a lot from him. Yeah, he was very good. 
but you know, I've had mentors outside of my direct manager as well. And they've all been super helpful too. So it's, yeah, it, it, I can't, yeah. I can't just pick one. I would feel, I would feel unfair. But yeah, there was def- definitely one that stands out there. Yeah. Yeah. I think it can make or break your career working for somebody who really takes your career and your development seriously. Yeah. And he did, to be fair. He was, he was very good at, he, kn- he just knew I wanted more. He knew I wanted more. He knew I wanted to progress my career. He was also very supportive when I started my own web agency with my partner so I had to explain to him look it's not going to affect my work it's not going to be any conflict but obviously I need to declare that I am starting this sorry this I am starting this new business um right Rebel web agency with my partner and I remember being worried about it because I'd had similar experiences before where I'd set up a separate business whilst I was still employed somewhere and you know no no you didn't tell well I did I didn't think I had to tell yeah I don't know if I should have told but it was a big no-no and it was like "Mm, you need to take that off your LinkedIn sort of conversation oh right so when they found out they said this is not yeah I mean it wasn't a conflict it was a completely different piece but anyway it was a it was a no-no um (laughs) but when I told him I think obviously I was probably worried about the experience I'd had last time and he was just so supportive and you know ultimately he knew one day that I was going to leave to this agency I was setting up for myself he knew that was the path I was going to be taking like he he it wasn't his first rodeo he ran a very very successful London um, advertisement agency that he'd sold years ago so he he knew that he knew the drill he knew where I wanted to go with this and he was so supportive and that meant the world to me and do you know what that probably retained me for a lot longer at that company because he was investing not just in me as that role as operations director he was investing in me as a person yeah. which really you know really meant something and when you work with people like that you really want to give it your all you know you you yeah. know that person has your back you know yeah. they they really are invested in your success so whatever you do and whatever the time you've got in that company you're just going to give it your all yeah for sure mm. um and, I, and I, I still talk to him now like years later I'm still in touch with him mm. so and he's still a really good cheerleader <laughs> <laughs> when you are going into a company deciding who you should work for I mean this is coming from a headhunter and like how do you decide mm. where to go say you have several offers on the table it's really important to assess who is going to be your boss yeah like immediately your boss do you get a sense that they are going to be taking your success seriously or are they the sort of person that's going to be you know not allowing you to go to their boss to have a conversation yeah. or watching your back not trust you because I think that relationship is the one that really makes it or breaks it and if you don't have a boss who has your success as they're one of their top criteria for their own success you're just not going to get ahead you're not going to get the feeling of satisfaction working there and you're not really going to progress as much as you are with somebody who really takes that yeah very seriously looking back at your own experience as a manager as a leader what mistakes did you make personally (laughs) Probably a lot. Because yeah. <laughs> I think we all do when we're first starting. Like I said to you, it's, it's, a, it's a new job. Yeah. You can't be expected to just know how to do this magically. Um, one mistake that ring that I can think of just off the top of my head is accidentally micromanaging. I think that was something I did. I not think I know. <laughs> I know I did. I it was there was there was a hu- huge project to work for a really high profile client. And I wanted to, one, make sure that it went really well, wanted to make sure that it worked for the client, wanted to show my own boss that this, this, this project, my team's got it, we've got this, like we can do this. So it was that. And then there was also wanted to show my team that we could do this. Like I'm here to support you. And how I thought I would show that was being really involved. And being the person to be like, have we got this? Have we done this? Have we thought about this? Like completely risk mitigating, really looking on that horizon of what are the things that could go wrong and how can we stop going wrong? There's a, there's a bit of a balance there to be struck for sure. And I just remember one of my colleagues at the time saying, 
I know what I'm doing, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, okay, sorry, you know. And I think, like you say, there's a, there's that trigger in you as well as you have to go back to that. Or why am I? Why am I getting this reaction? Or why am I feeling like this? And we just had a chat, and I was like, okay, I sense, you know, going back to our team norms. Let's talk about this together. And they were like, I know what I'm doing. And like, it just feels like you're constantly trying to give me instruction on stuff. And I was like, whoa, I'm so sorry. That's, I, this is where I'm coming from. This is why I'm doing it. So they're like, okay, I see why you're doing it. I understand why you're doing it. And I'm like, okay, but I can see how that's actually playing out. So now we both understand why and where that's all happening. We can adjust. Mm -hmm. So I took a step back. Mm -hmm. Do you so, think yeah. there is a place for micromanagement though? So I don't like the word micromanagement, <laughs> probably well, because it just comes with so many negative connotations. Yeah. But yes, sort of, like maybe not, maybe there's a better word for it. Mm. But I think when a team is very new or it's a new way of doing something, mm. if whether it be you as a manager or someone else in the team who has experience in something like that and you know it can be very challenging or you know the intricacies of it, and actually going through step by step by step by step, it, it might be actually the right approach. Like, I don't know, if you take a surgeon, for example, it's not just going to be a, yeah, okay, I'll just sit back and I'll let you have a go at that. <laughs> then that might be a good good time to be like, okay, it's this, 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 and, and this is exactly how you need to do it. You cannot veer off how I've told you to do it. Mm -hmm. So yes, there is a place for it. And I think it all depends on how well that team's been set up, how long they've been going, like... I think one of the like classic managerial mistakes I see make is giving too much autonomy too soon yes. to a team. Mm -hmm. What have you personally struggled with as a leader? So I think one of the things for me was getting my opinions across or my voice heard in senior leadership meetings. So at that sort of C-suite level, um, could be quite difficult at times for sure. Mm. And why do you think that is? A mix, I think. Um, I actually spoke to my mentor about it once. So I had an instance where I'd raised something, thought I'd got my point across, you know, quite clearly. It was specific. It wasn't too long. And it sort of just got, you know, the nod of, yeah, yeah, we've, we've heard that sort of thing and we're carrying on with this conversation. And it was, it was quite a crucial thing that I'd raised and nothing happened with it and I'd, I'd followed up with my own manager about it and they said they'd look into it and, and they did but then someone else said it about three months later and then all of a sudden it was all hands on deck and I'm like oh hold on a minute <laughs> I've been saying this for the last three months what what what's what's this about and it really it really got to me it sat with me for days probably weeks but it sat me for days and I thought something's not right here. And I, I've been raising this and it was quite a, you know, a serious thing. Why didn't it get the attention that it got today mm -hmm. when someone else said it in the meeting? Was it a man? It was, it was. And I spoke to my boss about it and I said, this is what's happened. This is, this is my viewpoint on what I have seen happen. You tell me if you think that is the viewpoint or if I miss something. I always like to fact check myself I always like to see actually have I understood that have I read the room as I think it is and I explained I don't you know I didn't think it was very good that this had happened and why do you think that is so we both had things to learn on that you know I took some feedback they took some feedback we both looked to improve which was good and now I'm very lucky to have had a manager who took that on board and actually did take actions about it so I am grateful for that but I also spoke to my mentor about it as well and he was somebody who was also in these meetings. And I said to him, next time we're in one of these meetings, can you do me a favor and can you just observe me a little bit more? Um, I'm not going to change anything. Or I'm going to try not to because I know you're watching me now. But I'm not going to change anything. Can you just watch? Because this is the problem I'm having. It's not the first time this has happened. And this, I, some, something's happening, so I need to understand what it is. And they gave me some feedback, which was great. Um, so yeah, it's that. that's something that I have personally struggled with in senior leadership positions. I'd like to, this is something that a 
CEO who came onto the show a little while back. She's now the CEO of a, a sports lifestyle company. And she was talking about this exact experience of sitting in the boardroom, saying something, being ignored, and then you know, a man would be saying, oh, hey, have you thought of it? It was like verbatim, exactly what she's just said. And everyone's like, oh, yeah, no, what a great idea. Best idea in the world. And it's like, I've literally just said that. And, you know, so she's faced that. And mm. she's a very, you know, incredible woman. And also a leader in her own in her own image so she doesn't try to be like somebody else but this is something that she has faced with and her response was well well how do you how do you ensure that doesn't happen and she says well because i've experienced it when i'm sitting in a boardroom now and i'm hearing all the other voices it's like my responsibility is to elevate those who may not be picked up on straight away mm -hmm. and to say well actually so and so said that yeah so I wonder almost like the manager that you went to what I would have liked to see from I presume it's a man it was a man yes uh, to say well actually Louise has just raised this you know with this point can we just you know draw attention so as a man who wants to also ensure that their team is being heard you and this is I'm talking to the audience I was like yeah. you whether you're a man or a woman you can help to elevate those voices in the room and it doesn't have to be a man or a woman mm -hmm. thing uh, it could be just somebody who perhaps isn't you know has a great idea but is not being listened to because they're not they don't look the same as whatever the status yeah. quo is so Unfortunately, this this happens a lot. Yeah, and sure. Whilst we don't want it to become a self fulfilling prophecy, there is still that message being sent back that somehow, I mean, even that experience, it's like you you've raised a concern, mm. you've tried to make that heard, and then someone else comes back, and everybody jumps on it. So it makes you question your own presentation skills. Yeah, whether you said it to the wrong person. As opposed to like, there's something wrong here that's outside of me. Yeah. As opposed to this, like somehow I'm defective. And sadly, I see a lot of that happening, especially, well, I mean, my world is also, you know, dealing with, you know, women. So, but I'm sure across the board, different cultures, different ideas also yeah. get kind of, you know, not noticed. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Age was always a thing for me as well, because it was always environments where people were generally older than me or I managed teams that were older than me. So I think that was something I felt I got dismissed on a little bit. Like I'd have people say, mm -hmm. when I joined a company, like, they'd always want to know how old I was. It was always a thing of, oh, you know, they'd have the general questions of getting to know you. And they'd be like, oh, just, um, how, how old are you? Mm -hmm. And I'm like, would you have asked someone else that question? And there was all, and I got, I still gassed it now, not as much now because I probably do look more my age, but there was a point where I looked a lot younger than I was and to the point where my partner would help me pick an outfit for a meeting the next day of what was going to make me look older. Wow. Because that's how much it played on my mind of I'm getting, my ideas are getting, you know, not taking us seriously because I look younger than I am and it shouldn't matter. Even if I did look a lot younger and was a lot younger mm -hmm. it, it shouldn't matter but to the point where I'm actually having to create an outfit and how I wore my hair what makeup I would wear to try and be taken more seriously if you like mm -hmm. in a meeting it's not really a great position to be in <laughs> but no. that's what I thought I needed to do sometimes well you're not an, alone in that no no yeah. I'm sure I'm sure I'm not and it's you know it's, it's not very nice a feeling is it to, to have that but yeah, so getting asked how old you are quite a lot, or the the classic, you remind me of my daughter, <laughs> get that quite a lot as well, which, mm -hmm. you know, I'd learned as I got older that I needed to actually question that straight away because it created a really weird bias, the unconscious one. Mm -hmm. It's like you you look young, so you're junior, so mm -hmm. you don't have enough experience, you're not wise, you know, hence I don't need to listen to you. Yeah, exactly. And I, uh, you know, just need to treat you like my daughter, like a child. Yeah. And I'm like, well, by saying I'm the you remind you of a daughter, you're putting me in that child category. In some ways, that's also a clue to you in terms of how they perceive you. Yeah. So, you know, you you already know that you are dealing with somebody who has that unconscious bias and, and sees you in a certain way. 
There is a McKinsey study, which I quoted before, and I really should go and like reread it so I can quote it much better. But it basically says there's no right age to be a woman. <laughs> You're either too young, good looking, incompetent, or you're past it. Yeah, it's like so, a Barbie speech. <laughs> well, this is it. It's like there is no in between. There isn't really a stage. And the in between, you're usually having kids, so you're kind of like irrelevant and a cost to the company anyway. Yeah. So it, you just you're just female. So yeah, just yeah, like yeah. whatever. <laughs> like you're, it's, it doesn't matter how old you are. Oh yeah. And I think it's just so detrimental to to young women also. Like, you know, you've gone through that experience. I've always looked young as well. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I always try to make myself look older with my clothes or like even like how you present yourself, yeah. like your speech or you know, like I was never kind of like the kind of girly girl anyway, but um, it, the fact that you're spending so much time and energy thinking about those things as opposed to dedicating that energy into just being good in your job yep. or, you know, innovating or creating something new, you're just having to like navigate this whole other world that an equivalent man doesn't even... It, they don't even question it. They just put on a blue navy blue suit, and that's fine. <laughs> it's a, uh, it's a, uh, yeah. You've, you've, yeah. Exactly what you said, Maria. Yeah. <laughs> so I just, yeah, it's, which is why this podcast is so important to me. Like, well, I don't always interview just women, and I interview many brilliant, interesting, successful men, but interviewing women in particular is so important to me because we need to see this. We need to see examples. We need yeah. to see examples of different kinds of women, older, younger, you know, in all shapes and sizes, doing something that is inspirational or different or hasn't been traditionally done because mm -hmm. it is possible. And I think we need we need to be able to see it to believe that it can yeah. be done. Yeah. And also to talk about these issues. I, I mean, I know this whole man versus woman thing and, you know, the but it, it does exist. There is no need to skirt around it. It, it. it. I wish more men would accept that that's the case yeah. and actually start doing something about it. I know we're like right now we are in, in March. So, you know, International Women's Day yes, is coming up. it is. And... You know, lots of companies like, oh, you know, we we're all about, you know, DNI and you know having more women, but really not taking the concrete steps towards that. Yeah. Um, so I I do interview some men who really do ask questions and do take that very seriously and seek the opinion of women to make sure that they're doing the right thing. Um, but I just I think this podcast would be very successful if a young man is watching it and sees a brilliant young woman or a brilliant female CEO or founder and says, I want to be like her. Mm. Yeah. It's like when I was growing up and I would see successful men or, you know, even like knights and fairy tales, like, yeah. I want to be like him. <laughs> yeah. Like, I want to see like young men saying, I want to be, be like her. her. Yeah, that's such a strong positive statement I love that yeah love that. and I have been fortunate to work with people who do get it or they want to improve even more so like I had one boss who I just finished reading How Women Rise and I was like great book and I told him about it he went and bought it the next day and then when he came to see me um in in a office visit he had it with him because he'd been reading it on the train and I'm like that for me meant a lot because I'm like he's genuinely trying to understand how he can help me with my career and how that works across different teams. So, so yeah, I was really pleased to see that. Yeah. We need more of that. Mm, I definitely. like that. Yeah, I always very like good. take notes of like, okay, great boss, yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. And with your leadership course, what's your ambition with it? What do you want it to achieve? I want new managers to stop feeling so stressed and alone and like they're just in quicksand I want them to be confident and successful so and that has a larger ripple effect on it it one helps that manager become that confident and successful leader 
but it also then helps the team of people who are also being managed by that person because we spend a lot of time at work and we all know that a lot of people leave jobs because of a bad boss. And I don't want those people who are new managers to become an accidental bad boss because they've just not had the right support or training or mentorship. So that's what the new manager course is all about. It's helping people avoid those common mistakes that I see over and over again. And, and it, do you know what? It's the guide I wish I had when I first started managing teams too. Mm. It's, it's, it's funny how a lot of companies are born out of frustration of not being able to get that one thing that you're yeah. like, I knew this would help me. So yeah, let's create it. I just, I wish I had it yeah. back then. <laughs> it's like a trusted little handbook because it's not a lengthy like a six-month program or anything it's not a HR course either it's actually about how do you be a manager and like here's all the things that no one will tell you about managing a team that you should probably know on day one and it's just going to help set you up for success like whether that be how to run a one-to-one like I've had some managers I'll go in I'm like okay how often are you one-to-ones we don't have them why because oh, I didn't know I needed to or I don't see the value in them or whatever it be like how to run one-to-ones how to get the most out of your team, how to implement change within your team, how to recruit the best talent for your team, how to re- retain team members, like all those things that you just are expected to know, especially if people have been promoted from within. Um, it's, it's a new job. Mm. Well, we'll link it in the show notes so okay. people can come and find it. But um, Louise, thank you so much. I really enjoyed talking to you. Like you're really clear in terms of what new managers need to to do you know how they should approach the situation and yeah just a, a breath of fresh air speaking with you so thank you so much oh thank you ever so much for having me on it's been great thank you you've been listening to anatomy of a leader podcast i'm your host maria vorostovsky if you haven't already please follow and subscribe this podcast and i'll see you in the next episode